Hey everyone, how you doing? It's good to be back. I uh, just got done watching the Broncos beat Houston. Uh, it was great seeing Tebow out there. Even if you could see here, I got my, my trusty Gator shirt on. Uh, it's because uh, nobody bothered to give me a Tebow shirt for Hanukkah or Christmas, although my wife and my daughter were wearing theirs. But it's always good to see the Broncos winning. It's always good to see Tebow out there leading the Broncos. Uh, it's a very lean schedule of reinforcement. We must take what we can get. And speaking of reinforcement schedules, we're going to go ahead and get started on the next section. I have a particular fondness for schedules of reinforcement. You know, usually during your time in school, there's certain moments that you could probably remember in your academic lives in which you learned about something that just completely opened up your eyes to stuff and you said, oh my gosh, that's pretty cool. I had two of these experiences uh, in school. One of them was when I was actually taking high school chemistry, and we uh, covered the uh, section on the periodic table. And I looked at that stuff, and I said, holy cow, look how orderly that is. You have all the uh, increases in the atomic weights are nice and orderly. You have the the uh, orbital shells that fill up in a certain way that determine some of these weights. Uh, it's all organized with uh, gases on one side, metals on the other, inert gases. And when you step back and look at that, you say to yourself, holy cow, what an orderly universe in which we live in. Well, the same thing held true when I got to the section on schedules of reinforcement when I took this class at the University of Florida. And we actually started working and studying these schedules of reinforcement, not just by studying their effects, but by looking at cumulative record after cumulative record after cumulative record until, holy cow, you look at that stuff and you say, now that's pretty orderly stuff. So that's the material that we're going to cover in this section. I hope you share my enthusiasm about this. And at least heed my warning that if you are going to be a behavior analyst practitioner, you had better have a very good understanding of the way schedules of reinforcement operate from simple to complex to compound schedules, and in particular, how we arrange contingencies of reinforcement. We need to pay a lot of attention to the contingencies and the schedules, even as much as we look at the actual reinforcer surveys that we conduct to determine what are the actual reinforcers. Even more important is how these reinforcers are arranged to contact behavior in time. So I'm going to go ahead and freeze the camera and get my pointer out. Let's go ahead and freeze first. And we are frozen. And get my pointer. And again, I am going to expand the screen for all of you so that we could see these minute differences in the patterns of these uh, reinforcement schedules. We're going to start off with the first schedule. And this is going to be one of two schedules that we describe as response-based. Response-based schedules are schedules in which a certain number of responses may be required in order to deliver a reinforcer. Now again, uh, there may be variations in the way I describe uh, these response-based schedules uh, in terms of how uh, they are described by the uh, Pearson-Cheney um, book. But I would prefer that you go ahead and go ahead and use these definitions um, and I could always elaborate further on the differences between what I was talking about and what Pearson Cheney are talking about. There's a minor variation, but they're basically the same things. The first schedule is called fixed ratio. We abbreviate this as FR, fixed ratio. And under a fixed ratio schedule, a response produces a re reinforcer according to a fixed number of responses that are counted from the preceding reinforcer. And then we would simply say that the reinforce is delivered after every nth response. For example, on a fixed ratio 10, this schedule of reinforcement would specify that 10 responses are required per reinforcer. That is, after the 10th response, a reinforce is delivered. And then the next reinforcer is going to be delivered after another 10 responses. It will always be 10 responses on a fixed ratio 10, not 9, not 8, but will always be 10 each and every time. That's what makes it actually fixed. And that's what also describes the ratio. For example, on fixed ratio 10, the schedule says for every 10 responses, you get one reinforcer, and there is your ratio, a 10 to 1 ratio. This type of schedule will generate a pattern of responding which is described as break-run, 
or by valued. And I will show you these schedules uh, patterns in a moment. Well, heck, let's just show it to you right now. There you go. That's classic fixed ratio performance. What you typically see after a reinforce is delivered, and that's indicated here by this little pip in the line, these are delivered, or these are marked as reinforcers. There's one, there's one, there's one. The schedule uh, in question here is actually performance on fixed ratio 200, and this is showing you 200 responses, reinforcement, 200 responses, reinforcement, Another 200 responses, the pen reaches the page and resets and so forth. And this shows you fixed ratio 120. Here's 120 responses, one reinforcer. Another 120 responses, another reinforcer. This also will show you the scale that I had mentioned to you. That is, if we have time on the x-axis and responses on the on the y-axis, you simply just take a look at the slope of these lines and fit these lines to here. It would appear that if you look at the slope of this line, this looks pretty close to this slope, which tells you that essentially it's three responses per second. So here we're looking at three responses per second. This looks like the rate might also be very close to three responses per second. Pretty close anyway. Okay. Now you'll note here characteristic in this schedule is that after every single reinforcer is delivered, you get a characteristic pause. You see it here, 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 and then you see the pauses here, and here, and here. It almost looks like a step going up, steps going upward, right? This is classic break run patterning, or what we call by value, going from zero to high rate, zero to high rate. And performance under fixed ratio schedules generally look this way, regardless of whether we're looking at the behavior of a rat on fixed ratio 200, or a pigeon under fixed ratio 200, or a human under fixed ratio 200. These characteristic patterns emerge regardless of the species that we're talking about. Let's go back a second and talk a little bit further about this. And so we talk about bi-value patterning under fixed ratios. We note here that the number of responses on these schedules remain constant from reinforcer to reinforcer. That is, I spend Example, and therefore the number of responses will be constant from one reinforcer to the next. In other words, it will always be 10. And it will stay 10 until I change that ratio requirement. If I decide to increase the ratio requirement to fixed ratio 50, which requires 50 responses per reinforcer, then the number of responses remain constant variable. Okay. Direct variables are those variables that as an experimenter or as a practitioner, you would directly control in a behavior plan. How many uh, responses are required for a reinforcer? How many stars on a uh, page must a student obtain in order to get the reinforcer that is arranged for him for completing, say, the number of math problems on a page correctly and so forth and so on? These are the direct variables in the sense that we can control this. However, from one reinforcer to the next, the amount of time it takes will vary from one reinforcer to the next. In other words, when you look at the situation here, you could see that from this reinforcer to this reinforcer is going to be a little bit longer than from this reinforcer to that reinforcer. Why? Well, you have the direct variable, which is approximately fixed ratio 200, the amount of time it takes to do these 200 responses, and as I mentioned, that's the direct variable that the experimenter controls, but what the experimenter cannot control directly are these pauses, and you'll see here that the pause after this reinforcer is longer than that one. This one looks pretty close to this, but this pause is a little bit longer. If you look over on this performance patterning here, you could see that this pause is a little bit shorter than that one, which is longer than that one, which is shorter, which is this one's shorter than this. 
and so forth and so on. So these pause times change from one reinforcer to the next. And because of the changes in pause time, the overall rate will change from one reinforcer to the next. And what happens here is that the inter-reinforcement times between that reinforcer and that reinforcer will necessarily be longer than the inner reinforcement time between this reinforcer and that one. Why? Because there's differences in pauses. So what we come back and look at here is something called the indirect variable, which describes the inter-reinforcement time, which varies from one reinforcer to the next because we as experimenters and practitioners have limited degree of control over those pauses, and therefore we can't directly control the inter-reinforcement time. We can control the number of responses, but we really can't control how long it takes to emit those responses. Okay? And this is also characteristic of the variables which govern uh, schedule control. Okay. Note here that post-reinforcement pause, generally speaking, is affected by ratio requirement. That is, the longer... The more, I'm sure I should say, the more, uh, the higher the ratio requirement, the longer the post reinforcement pause. Let me show you another pattern that we could see here. Let's see here. This shows you the transition from fixed ratio 185 to fixed ratio one, to fixed ratio 65. So here we have 185 responses. Here we have 65 responses. And this is the same pigeon that we're looking at here, performance from the same pigeon. And you can clearly see here that the inter-reinforcement time on this schedule is much longer than the inter-reinforcement times on this schedule. In other words, the pigeon is obtaining reinforcement almost triple the amount on this schedule than over here. If you look at this, 65 to 185, this is almost threefold more reinforcement under this condition than this one. And generally speaking, if you're a hungry pigeon, this would be a much more favorable condition for you. Why? Because you're getting reinforcers three times faster than you are over here. And of course, you're your own worst enemy when you're also taking a, 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 a long amount of time of pausing here. But as you're going to find out, this is not necessarily by choice. Higher Ratio requirements generate longer post-reinforcement pauses, which in turn will reduce the overall amount of reinforcement you're going to get in time. That is, interestingly enough, the more ratio requirement you require out of an organism, rather than increasing productivity, it actually has a detrimental effect that although you're doing more behavior, when it comes time to pause, you're pausing longer. And that's going to reduce your overall rate of responding. When you look at it over here, you have 
Okay, now we won't have a chance to talk about adjunctive behavior in this particular class, but suffice to say that schedules of reinforcement, in particular fixed ratio schedules, can generate a variety of behaviors that we call adjunctive behaviors, which are highly excessive kinds of behavior post-reinforcement, which look sort of bizarre and strange, uh, and can actually be somewhat excessive, uh, but those are actually a function of sometimes these schedules of reinforcement. Perhaps at some point we may have a chance to talk about this at, at another point uh, in your course work at um, UC Denver. Here are some examples of fixed ratio requirements. Piecework, what we see when people are working in factories, that you are paid based on the actual commission and you actually have to do uh, maybe assembly work where you assemble a certain amount of work over time and the more work that you actually do, the more you get paid. Paste running or exercise are also examples of fixed ratios in which you set up these ratios of how much work you do, how many uh, miles you might actually run on a, um, on a treadmill, or how many reps you actually do on Nautilus equipment. You may say, well, I'll do you know, 15 reps on this machine, then I'll move to the next machine and do 15 reps, and then I'll do 15 reps over here, and so forth and so on. And then you simply have a fixed ratio requirement um, on those machines as well. All right. So again, I showed you here fixed ratio performance. Now what's interesting, by the way, is that when you start off uh, using these schedules of reinforcement, and here what you're going to look at here is a fixed ratio 65, you basically see this periodic spacing of these pip marks, which are the actual deliveries of reinforcers. If you are actually able to, uh, require to have to read what a schedule of reinforcement looks like, and by the way, you're probably going to need to do this on later exams, so listen up. You could see here that these pip marks, these hash marks, are equally spaced, which would indicate that the chances are the schedule of reinforcement is fixed. Why? Look at how evenly spaced these marks are. When you see something that uh, looks like this, this should be the first tip to you that you're looking at a fixed schedule of reinforcement. Now the question becomes, is it a fixed ratio or is it a fixed interval, as we're going to study here shortly? And when you start exposing uh, the rat, the pigeon, or whatever to these schedules of reinforcement, you get basically what looks like a linear rate of responding, and there's not much differentiation responding to the reinforcers. But as you're exposed to these conditions over time, you can see it goes up, sets, and then we see a whole bunch more ratios run. And at this point, you still don't see anything which looks like break run until you look closely, and then all of a sudden, there's one. There's one, there's one, and as time starts passing, look what happens within the very first session of exposure to fixed ratio. You get one here, and you start getting these little tiny break runs. And then as the session progresses, look what happens. After a 40-minute session, this is characteristically the pattern that will emerge no matter what animal you are working with under these contingencies of reinforcement. And it is quite remarkable that when you teach students this, it really is one of those things where it will happen every single time. You start the session off with a pigeon that does this. By the end of the session, you get a pigeon that does this. And students are generally amazed at how orderly this uh, pattern emerges within the very first session. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to the next schedule of reinforcement called variable ratio, abbreviated VR. Under a variable ratio schedule, a response produces a reinforcer following a variable number of responses counted from the preceding reinforcer. So rather than on fixed ratio where every nth response will produce a reinforcer and that number of responses never changes from one run reinforcer to the next, on variable ratio, the reinforcer requirement changes from one rein, uh, reinforcer to the next, and it's totally unpredictable which the number of responses are required per reinforcement. All you know is, is that a certain number is required, and if we take all of those numbers and add them up and divide by the number of reinforcers that are delivered, we come up with an average number of responses per reinforcer, and that is the value of the variable ratio reinforcer. Okay. 
this kind of schedule will produce at a very high steady constant rate of responding and it will produce very little post reinforcement pause in fact i like to say these schedules literally obliterate post reinforcement pause let me show you what i mean this is a characteristic performance of key pecking in a pigeon on a variable reinforcement schedule where it's variable ratio 360 which states that on the average 360 resp responses are required per reinforcer sometimes it will be 360 other times it will be as little as maybe 5 or 10 maybe sometimes 30 or 40 sometimes longer like about 200 and so forth and so on but if you take all of these numbers of responses that are emitted in a session and divide by the total time of the session you come up with an average number of responses per reinforcer and in this case for this schedule it's 360 okay now note here that you could see that you do not have equal spacing between these reinforcers some of these inner reinforcement intervals are extensive some are shorter some are shorter still and up here you could see a situation where they're very closely distributed here uh, you probably see here a very long run of responses before you get a reinforcer and all of a sudden you have to do a few responses here you have only about two or three responses and it was just again by by luck of the draw what the number of responses required here we have computers which generally uh, pr uh, produce these variable ratios anyway that's how we generate these ratios okay and this is after six sessions check out what happens with late performance and you could see here high steady constant rates of responding going on all the way up the page and down the page and up the page with very little reinforcement provided interspersed in here you could see here here's a very long uh, uh, run of responses from this reinforcer here the pen resets it comes up it resets it comes up and here's where your next reinforcer delivery is okay and what's interesting about this is that unlike post reinforcement pause where you have a characteristic pause after reinforcer this schedule not only gets rid of post reinforcement pause it literally generates a burst of responding check out what happens here here's a reinforcer delivered and now instead of a pause you have literally a higher rate of responding right after the delivery of reinforcement and it almost serves as like an energizing effect you could see that here and a high rate burst of responding until finally it peters out a little bit and the rate lowers down a little bit lowers down a little bit until the reinforcer is delivered and then you see these energizing effects here you see the rate of responding coming down and then all of a sudden reinforce is delivered and then a burst and then you see it here and then you see it here and you see one here and what this kind of shows you here is is that ratio schedules will generate very different patterns of responding depending on the probability of reinforcement on fixed schedules of reinforcement where the probability of reinforcement is pretty fixed it's going to generate a post reinforcement pause each and every time post reinforcement pause is very characteristic of fixed ratio but on variable ratio you have just the opposite effect and this is a very good way to get rid of these post reinforcement pauses okay what are some of the other characteristics well in addition to the high steady constant rate of responding you have very little post reinforcement pauses and here are some of the examples of variable ratio reinforcement gambling is a great example of this that literally gambling generates very very high rates of responding very little post reinforcement pause okay and that's because of the schedule of reinforcement you oftentimes will see people after they've done a run of responding on a one arm bandit on a slot machine and all of a sudden they start nailing a reinforcer another re quick reinforcer and another reinforcer it is very difficult to try to redirect somebody from a slot machine after hitting three uh, payoffs almost within a very short period of time and in fact people actually come away with an energized effect people begin rubbing their hands after getting this they will oftentimes say this is exciting now I'm on a roll uh, I'm on a winning streak 
which basically generates a high rate of a person pulling down the lever on a slot machine at a higher rate because of this schedule of reinforcement and its payoff. You will also see the same sort of behavior here with people who are on commission-based types of salaries. So when we look at another characteristic, commission-based sales are oftentimes predicated on variable ratio. Why? Because door-to-door -door salespeople, car salespeople, telephone solicitors are not operating under a fixed ratio schedule. It's not like every 10th call I make, I will make a sale, and then the next 10th call I make, I will make a sale. Quite unpredictably, we never know which sale is going to be the one that sells. Which uh, This is why real estate agents have a very, very high rate of constantly being on telephones, constantly trying to find out where property is and so forth and so on, because it is the schedule of reinforcement that generates this high, high rate of behavior. A very good example, by the way, if you ever want to see, I, I often like to point out movies that... Um, depict these kinds of um, contingencies operating. So a couple of movies I would clearly recommend. One movie is called, called Glen Gary, Glen Ross. It was a classic movie uh, with a whole bunch of stars, but it is a movie uh, which shows you how ruthless uh, the real estate uh, business could actually be, how commissions are based on variable ratio reinforcement, and how, how incredibly competitive and compulsive the behaviors are of people who are on these schedules because that's what we're talking about in gambling we talk about compulsive gamblers we talk about compulsive salespeople workaholics people who cannot stop who are constantly on the telephone constantly working i used to work with a guy who was a uh, who was the director of admissions uh who was always working late nights weekends anything possible to fill up the beds on on the hospital units because that's the name of the game for these guys and it's very clear that their their salaries are predicated on variable ratio they are given extra commission if they fill a certain number of beds okay by the way i'm not sure how ethical that is but like i said i i do know people and contingencies that were arranged that way okay all right so one of the things I want you to consider here, and we will come back and talk about this when we get to the section on radical behaviorism, is that when we start talking about people who engage in high rates of behaviors, there is a very quick tendency to immediately label them as ADHD and write off the problem as nothing more than a metabolic abnormality. I can tell you that based on what I have seen over the years, many of the behaviors that have come my way for behavior reduction programming, which has been labeled ADHD or compulsive OCD behaviors, were better addressed by addressing the schedule of reinforcement. If you could reduce the schedule of reinforcement for these behaviors, you will actually reduce the rate of behaviors. And again, these behavior problems, OCD behaviors and ADHD behavior problems, are more a problem of rate than they are a problem of operant behavior. Okay, so let's move on. I want to show you something here. When we make a transition from fixed ratio 360, which again is your break run patterning, and as you remember here, I'm going to show you just to remind you, hate to make you go through all this stuff, but it will make my point very clear. This is the kind of performance on fixed ratio 185, this classic break run performance. How long does it take for behavior to change from this kind of performance of break run to this kind of performance in which you completely get rid of post reinforcement pause and it turns behavior into what looks like compulsive responding? That's exactly the kind of work that Skinner did in 1957 with Charlie Furster in Schedules of Reinforcement. He just, th those two just examined all these variations. What happens when you do this, when you go from this schedule to that schedule and back and forth? And here was a classic example of going from fixed ratio 360 to variable ratio 360. In other words, there were many sessions run under fixed ratio 360 until the, the performance was stable. And then on the next day, and from that point on, Skinner just uh, and Furster just switched the schedule to VR360. 
Look at how quickly the transition takes place. Remember, Bert, you got an animal who was, okay, another 360 responses, gets a reinforcer. Here's that long post reinforcement pause. They make about one or two responses, and bam, they get an instant reinforcer. And then they make another two or three responses, bam, instant reinforcement. They're probably thinking to themselves, boy, things have changed. Now this is a schedule I could live with. I no longer have to emit 360 responses every single reinforcer. Now I'm able to actually, as we say in the profession, cop reinforcement a little bit faster. But as you and I know, we are the master controllers of the direct variable. And in this case, although this is a favorable condition, this is not going to happen very often for this pigeon in the same way that when a person hits two simultaneous uh, payoffs on a slot machine, that's favorable right then and there, but that's not going to be the conditions that's sustained over the long haul on these various gambling devices. And you can see here, look at what happens to post-reinforcement pause as soon as they're exposed to this contingency. It's almost instantaneous that you immediately get this high compulsive rate of behavior and immediately wipe out post-reinforcement pause. Pretty cool, huh? Look at how quickly things change when you go from fixed ratio to variable ratio. And you could bet the same thing sort of must be happening with human behavior that is reinforced under these conditions and now is reinforced on a variable schedule of reinforcement. Now, what happens when we have to switch back over from variable ratio 360 to fixed ratio 360? Do we have a, a rapid transition back? Actually, no. Here we go, the second transition from variable ratio 360 to fixed ratio 360. Look at how much behavior is occurring here, even though it is fixed ratio. Break runs, but it's happening in the middle of the run. You get this burst of responding, then it slows down, and then it starts again. They get a reinforcer burst of responding. Uh, now it's starting to decelerate into a break run here, here, here here and eventually look what happens the post reinforcement this thing here starts moving downward closer to reinforcement you see it here you see it here you see it happening here until finally we're starting to recapture that break run performance so you can recapture it but look how much behavior is going on here in order to get back to this point now the reason why i bring this up is because when we are working with individuals who have problematic behaviors that are reinforced according to these schedules of reinforcement, when environments are very inconsistent, they are by definition variable. And it's inevitable that a lot of times problematic behaviors are reinforced on variable ratio schedules, not fixed ratio schedules. So given the situation that you have an individual that you now have a behavior treatment plan you have to write, you've done your functional assessment, you find that attention is the motivational variable maintaining the behavior, and even more of a problem, the attention that they've been getting has been intermittent and probably variable ratio. And you are now going to write a behavior plan which is going to try to set up reinforcement contingencies and change and get away from this variable ratio reinforcement and this high rate of problematic behavior that's sustained. This is what you have to contend with in terms of behavior that's reinforced on variable ratio. And it's something you really want to consider as you're developing your treatment plans. It's one thing to tell somebody, stick with it. But I really think that you need to come to grips with the fact that if you have a person whose behavior is sustained with a history of variable ratio reinforcement, you've really got your work cut out for you. This is why understanding schedule of reinforcement is so important when you're developing treatment plans as much, if not more important, than determining the actual reinforcers themselves. Okay, let's move on. Another schedule of reinforcement is called fixed interval schedules. Okay, This is a time-based schedule, as we call it, but I believe that Pearson Cheney also will refer to this as a response-based schedule. The fact that it's time-based versus response-based is not the critical thing here. I'm more concerned that you understand the difference between fixed interval and fixed ratio and variable interval and variable ratio. So on a fixed interval schedule, abbreviated FI, in this schedule, you only have to make one response. However, timing is everything. That first response will be reinforced 
but only after an interval time has passed. And that interval of time will remain fixed from one reinforcer to the next reinforcer. So for example, if we are looking at a schedule such as fixed interval five minutes, this schedule of reinforcement specifies that the first response that occurs after five minute passes from the last reinforcer will be reinforced. Any responses that occur before five minutes never get reinforced. Only that first response that occurs after five minutes will get reinforced. And that five minute value will stay in effect from one reinforcer to the next. And throughout the experiment, that's what defines it as fixed interval. That is, that interval remains constant from one reinforcer to the next throughout the experiment. This will generate a pattern of responding, which we call positive accelerated, or as I mentioned before, the fixed interval scallop. And this is what it looks like. Ah, a scallop. This is a temporary smooth scallop on a fixed interval five minute schedule. You could see just like on fixed ratio, right after reinforcers are delivered, you have these post reinforcement pauses. However, note the difference in the transition. The transition is a very gradual kind of positively accelerated, which slowly accelerates over time. You could see it here. You could see it gradually over time. So that as time passes from one reinforcer to the next, the opera response of key pecking gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and the rate increases until the next reinforcement, and then we have another post-reinforcement pause. Now, again, we are tempted to compare this with fixed ratio post-reinforcement pause, and you would be correct. All schedules of reinforcement that are fixed from one reinforcer to the next will generate a post-reinforcement pause, but it looks differently on how that animal comes out of that transition of the post-reinforcement pause. Here they come out in a much more gradual manner, but as you recall with fixed ratio, they came out in a completely different manner. Now again, bear with me, I'm going to go through this fast, I'm just going to go back and show you fixed ratio again. Okay, note Post-reinforcement pause is followed by an instantaneous change of behavior from zero to high rate, zero to high rate, zero to high rate. And you could see that abrupt change right here. Look at the abrupt change from zero to high rate. This is not a smooth, gradual transition. This is an abrupt change from low to high rate. Okay? It's almost, by the way, would appear that the animal goes from zero behavior to high rate behavior, we could actually say that this looks almost as if the animal was bipolar. That is, they go from no behavior to a high rate of behavior, to a low rate of behavior, to a high rate of behavior. It certainly is cyclic, as we would say in some behaviors that are bipolar. Okay, So essentially, we might look at this as a type of behavior that appears to be bipolar in nature. Compare that, again, with the transition of fixed interval it is a much smoother transition. And in fact, when I show you this, this is really characteristic kind of performance of fixed interval. Although you certainly have differences in how much behavior is occurring, you note here that one thing is clear. On this, which is a fixed interval four, the inter-reinforcement time is always going to be constant. Why? Because as an experimenter or practitioner, you set it for four minutes. So from here to here, it's four minutes. From here to here, it's four minutes. From here to here, it's four minutes. That is the direct variable. What is not controlled by the experimenter and is the indirect variable is how many responses are occurring within this particular inner reinforcement interval. So in other words, fixed ratio and fixed interval are really polar opposites. On a fixed ratio schedule, the direct variable are the number of responses between one reinforcer and the next. Why? Because on a ratio schedule, as a practitioner, you can control this. You cannot control as a practitioner the amount of time between one reinforcer and the next because sometimes the animal pauses longer, sometimes they pause shorter. Now on a fixed interval schedule, the situation reverses itself. In this situation, because you specify the interval of time between one reinforcer and the next, you can control the inter-reinforcement time 
and here we set it at four minutes it will be at four minutes but you could see a number of responses between one reinforcer and the next varies because you cannot control that on an interval schedule and you could see here a high a lot of responses are emitted in the four minutes over here very few responses are emitted in the five minutes sometimes many responses sometimes very few responses okay and again this just describes some of the dynamic properties that we see with reinforcement schedules okay again these schedules uh, have inter-reinforcement times that are constant from reinforcer to the reinforcer. That's the direct variable. The number of responsors varies from reinforcer to variable. That's the indirect variable in this situation. Okay. All right. Another feature of, ratio, of, of interval schedules is that these schedules are very resistant to extinction than ratio schedules. You know, when you're on a ratio schedule, you're sort of stuck with a schedule. When the practitioner or the experimenter says, dude, it's fixed ratio 500, live with it. 499 will not cut it, 488 won't cut it, you must do 500. And that number will not go away unless the experimenter radically changes that number and lowers that, or the practitioner lowers that. Now, on interval schedules, interestingly enough, you don't have to worry as much about that because it only requires one response. And in this situation, the longer you wait to make that response, the chances are when you do respond and make that one response on the interval schedule, the interval's timed out. Okay, This is something we'll come back to later on. These schedules also are generator schedules for adjunctive behavior, again, because adjunctive behavior uh, is, is prominent on schedules that, that have these uh, post-reinforcement pauses. Here are some examples of interval schedules. I like to think about this one, not because I like going on Ticketmaster to find my tickets, but when we go on Ticketmaster, we are on, in a sense, a type of interval schedule. That is, we find out tickets go on sale this Saturday at 10 o'clock to go see, you know, U2 or the police, you know, the reunion concert, you know, or the Rolling Stone, you know, Medicare reunion concert or whatever we're talking about here. Uh, and people clamor to get onto that site as quickly as possible. That is an interval schedule because you do know when the tickets go online, and you start seeing that even though you know tickets don't sales don't go on sale until 10 o'clock on Saturday, you're already engaging in what I would call ticket obtaining behaviors. That is, you may go online before 10 o'clock and start taking a look at where the seats are located. What sections do you want? How is the how is the uh, how is it going to be set up? Will the um, will the concert um, over uh, at the at the center be set up at, uh, where it's uh, in the middle of the arena, or will it be on one end uh, where the musicians play on one end and it's uh, the entire um, arena is going to be filled up in a horseshoe manner? These are the questions you might want to start thinking about. You want to also make sure uh, how handy is your um, is your uh, credit card because you're going to have to buy this on credit card. So if you all of a sudden obtain the tickets of your of your choice and you say, okay, I'm all set to go, and now you have to start seeking out your credit card and finding out do you have enough on this balance to cover the tickets and so forth and so on, uh, and all of a sudden you're going to lose those tickets because they're they are uh, available only for a short period of time before the interval elapses and you have to go back online, you're going to lose those tickets. Now, like I said, I'm not an expert on this, but I've been burned many times, which is why I'm not an expert on this. I let somebody else buy the tickets and I just pay them to do that. I don't have the patience and tolerance to do this stuff. But some people do this really well. I have a cousin who is an expert on getting Florida Gator tickets at, at Florida Field in Gainesville. I would never be able to do this, and if I did, I'd be paying through the nose, but you know, it pays to actually be connected. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so here's your interval schedules. So we've talked about fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval. It should come as no surprise to you um, that we have variable interval schedules, and I'm going to go ahead and skip to that. Before I do that again, I want to show you uh, the acquisition of fixed interval performance. When you take a pigeon and put the pigeon in the chamber or a rat in the chamber, and you expose them to fixed interval one minute, you don't start off getting these beautiful scallops. Recall on fixed ratio, when you expose 
uh, the um, pigeon or rat to fixed ratio 65 with novel stimuli, you also don't get break run patterning until well into the session. But boy, after 40 minutes of this contingency, you get break run patterning on fixed ratio beautifully. The same thing holds true on fixed interval. You can see here these even spaced lines. You see that? Remember when you see these equal, these equal spaced pip marks, that is your first indicator. You must be looking at a fixed schedule of reinforcement. Right? So as you start getting experience looking at this stuff, pat yourself on the back when you start recognizing patterns of reinforcement because not many people know how to do this. Okay? So you know it's going to be clearly fixed schedule. Now the question is, is it fixed ratio or is it fixed interval? Look what happens after exposure to these contingencies. You start getting these nice little tiny, tiny scallops so that by the end of the session, look what you got here. Beautiful fixed interval FI1 scallop performance. So you should start being able to recognize here a couple of things. If I give you this type of a pattern on a test, you should say, oh, equal spacing of reinforcers must be fixed. Key question, is it ratio or is it interval? We would say it's interval. Why? Because you have this nice little scallop. If this were little tiny little break runs, you would know it's fixed ratio. And as we get into complex schedules, you're going to see this again and again. You're going to get pretty good at recognizing these patterns of performances. Okay. Now, the other thing you should be able to start looking at here is if you had to guess what the run rate is, how do you do that? Take a look at these lines right in there, the slope of the line, and see where that fits over here. It looks like it would be somewhere between 3 and 1, right? This line, slope of the line, would fit cleanly right in here, and it would be your best guess that you could just simply look at this record and say, the run rate for this pigeon is probably somewhere around 2 responses per second. And you would be correct. Let's move on. So we come to variable interval. The variable interval schedule works as follows. In this situation, again, we have an average number of uh, time values per reinforcer. On fixed, that value stayed the same from one reinforcer to the next, but on these schedules, it actually varies from one reinforcer to the next. Sometimes the inter-reinforcement time value is going to be as short as 30 seconds, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes 10 seconds. It's always going to be varied, but if you take all of those time values and add them up and divide by the number of reinforcers, you come up with what's called the variable interval schedule value. This will generate what I call a low to moderate steady constant rate of responding. Again, you have the added benefit of eliminating post-reinforcement pausing. These schedules are very, very resistant to extinction, and I have to tell you, I love using variable interval schedules of reinforcement in virtually all of my behavior plans. It is far easier to use. The benefits are, are, are greater uh, amounts of responding. You don't have the variation of low rate, high rate like you get on fixed ratio. You don't have the excessively high compulsive rate like you have on, uh, uh, on variable ratio, fixed ratio. You don't have those problems. And you get rid of all of this post-reinforcement pause, and you have this nice persistent rate responding. When I set up schedules of reinforcement, for example, for replacement behaviors, those are the behaviors that I arrange to teach individuals to replace the function of problematic behaviors. Say, instead of hitting somebody to get attention, raise your hand to get attention. Tap them on the shoulder to get attention. Go up to them and say, excuse me, can you talk to me? Those are the kinds of behaviors that we will reinforce on variable interval schedules so that they don't occur you know, at high rate, low rate, or at very, very, very high rates. The performance that you get when you start off going from continuous reinforcement to variable interval schedules, this looks really scraggly. Um, and I can remember I was uh, studying variable interval schedules back when I was working on my master's thesis. And I was very discouraged when I was starting to get these very erratic kinds of patterns. But my major advisor, Ed Malicotti, said, be patient. Order will come around in a couple of sessions. And if you keep running this out long enough, variable interval two minutes will eventually look like that. Now again, it starts off looking like that. Eventually it will look like this. 
It gets more conformity after the second or third session. And by the end of the fourth session, check it out. Now again, this looks sort of linear. This is that moderate rate of responding. Again, can you see the erratic spacing of the pit marks? When you look at a schedule like this and a performance like this, your first thought is irregularly spaced reinforcement pit marks. It must be variable schedule, and you would be right. Now the question is, is it interval or is it ratio? Recall here that interval schedules will give you a generally lower rate of behavior. I don't want to go flipping back over to the variable ratio, but you recall on that variable ratio, those lines were almost virtually uh, vertical by the time the final performance came about on variable ratio 360. Compare that with this. These are much more steady, constant rate of responding, which is sort of like what we would actually want to see in a setting, that a person is persistent, they engage in replacement behaviors over a, a, a moderate rate of responding, and that when they get a reinforcer, they don't pause and stop emitting replacement behaviors. They get right back and keep doing these replacement behaviors again and again and again in a manner that uh, maximizes reinforcement. Okay, let me go back a little bit and talk about some other features. Um, as some of the examples, getting through on a telephone call after a busy signal, you don't get on a telephone, you don't call, you know, make, you know, dial it 15 times and then stop and pause and then dial it 15 times again. So it's really not fixed ratio, your behavior of calling somebody up on the telephone. Remember that the amount of time required depends on the person who's talking on the phone and how long they're on the telephone for. Okay. And if you're waiting to get through and they don't have call waiting on their telephone, your phone call to them will only be successful the first time you call and they've already hung up the phone. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Hopefully it does. It makes sense to me. So let me explain it one more time again. If you're going to try to call somebody and you don't have call waiting, your telephone call to that person will not be successful because you'll constantly get a busy signal. That phone will be, uh, that person will be available the, as soon as they hang up the phone, the very first time you call them up, hopefully you get there before the next phone call, that will be reinforced. And because you don't know the time that they're talking on the telephone from one person to the next, your behavior under this situation is under a variable interval schedule, as would be receiving an email. Okay, you never know when you're going to get an email. So what you do is you periodically will check your emails, right? And probably... This is what your performance looks like when you check emails. Every once in a while, check it, double check it and see, double check it and see. Um, now, if you're like my daughter, she has this little signal that you know rings on her cell phone every time she receives a, a, um, a, an email or a text message. But in the absence of that, this is the kind of performance my daughter does. And I know this because I watched my daughter this entire vacation, this Christmas vacation, and it's amazing. She cannot put down her cell phone. It's, it's, it's almost like an appendage attached to her right hand that she's constantly got to look at, even during her favorite movies, when she's watching, you know, the, uh, the, uh, she had all of the episodes of Friends that she was watching that she got for Christmas, and she's sitting there watching it, but checking her text messages on this nice, clean, variable interval schedule. Okay. All right. Uh, what else can we talk about here? Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about something briefly uh, before we conclude with simple schedules of reinforcement. And that is, up until now, we've been talking about discrete operant responses. That is, a key peck, a lever press, somebody raising their hand, somebody pulling down a, uh, a lever on a slot machine in a casino. These are discrete operant responses that each time you do these responses may or may not pay off with reinforcement depending on what the contingencies are that are arranged. We could also look at schedules and reinforce, oddly enough, the time between each successive response. We call these inter-response times, or we abbreviate this as IRTs. Okay? IRTs describe that reinforcers are delivery contingent upon the time between consecutive responses. We could have one response that's required to be followed by another response, but we could specify response one and response two must be separated by 30 seconds, two minutes, three days. These are what we call IRT schedules. And we could do this based on 
simply specifying the time between responses. If I specify that pigeons must peck a key to get reinforced, but not only must they peck a key, but the time between one key peck and another key peck must be 10 seconds or longer, what you start seeing happening here is that IRTs longer than 10 seconds are reinforced and short IRTs are not. That is, if a pigeon pecks the key and then they wait 0 to 2 seconds and peck it again, they're not going to get reinforced. Or for 4 seconds, or 6 seconds, or 8 seconds. No, in this specification, that this must be 10 seconds or longer. That's what gets reinforced. And when you arrange it that way, you find that short IRTs decrease in frequency and you get these longer and longer IRTs. And this distribution will shift out. If all of a sudden I specify that no longer must it be 10 seconds or longer, I'm going to make it 15 seconds or longer. What that's going to do is take this data point here and push it out further to 15 seconds and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden these high ones that are here, the rate of responding for these 10 to 12 second IRTs will come down to these levels over here. And in this way, we could actually push behaviors so that we have higher rates and lower rates. This is going to be important when we start talking about behavior reduction plans. And when we use schedules of reinforcement, which are called DRL and DRH schedules. Okay, we'll come back and talk about that. So we could specify one schedule of reinforcement called the IRT greater than T, which says that two responses must be separated by a time greater than T for reinforcers to be delivered. In the literature, you may see this called differential reinforcement of low rates, or DRL. Certainly, by the time you get to course two and course three and four in this, class, in, in this course sequence, they will be talking about DRL programming, and you're going to be wanting to be familiar with this. We are going to call this IRT greater than T, but we're going to be using this synonymously. Okay? Because an IRT that's greater than T will produce lower rates of behavior. And I'll show you how this works. Okay? This works because the longer the reinforced IRT, the lower the rate of responding. Okay? If I require only one second between responses so that a peck of a key, and then a second passes, and then a peck of the key, and so forth. I'm requiring short IRTs. The rate of responding is going to be higher. But if all of a sudden I require this key peck to be followed by this key peck, and it has to be 10 seconds or 15 seconds, key pecking rate will mathematically come down. It's inevitable that that's going to actually happen. Okay. And again, like I said, I will show you how this actually works in, in, in um, the other um, um, sessions when we get to this section. We could also have what's called an IRT less than T, which specifies the time between two successive responses must be less than that for reinforcer delivery. This is also synonymous with, what, with what's called a DRH schedule, differentially reinforcing higher rates, because the shorter the IRT, the higher the rates of responding. Okay, and that's what this specifies here. Good examples of that, of these kinds of schedules, are coupons with expiration dates. If you have a coupon that says, you are entitled to get this item two for one. If you go to get a bag of Doritos, present this coupon, you could get two bags for one. You could present that coupon at any time. Why? Because there is no IRT that's re required. You could present this coupon, and if you have multiple coupons, you could present them any particular time. Right? However, if you have a coupon that says, this is two for one, two bags of Doritos with one coupon, right? That, that you can get two for one. And it also says that you must use this coupon um, within three days of the time you receive the coupon. It's going to induce you to spend and buy that uh, and spend your coupons faster. What the, the reason why they do this, by the way, they put expiration dates on there, is so that although you are getting a break on the price, it necessarily induces you to go out and use these coupons and buy the product quicker than you normally would. This is why they put expiration dates on it so, that it, so that people do not just store up a bunch of these coupons and then go to Safeway, you know, and uh, make a killing there. They present, you know, 40 or 50 of these coupons and they walk out with, you know, you know five baskets filled with Doritos. 
uh, and clean the store out. Uh, and by the way, this is one of the things that you might want to think about here. I, I work with individuals who, who uh, use token reinforcement, and they have a tendency to hoard their tokens. And, and by doing so, they save up and save up and save up, and then they present the tokens to their, to their host home provider, and the host home provider or the parent goes, oh my gosh, I, I, there's no way that I could deliver these number of reinforcers. So one way to induce uh, consumers or children to uh, spend these things a little bit faster is give them these tokens, but put expiration dates on there. It's a good way to manage your resources. And again, this is something that we'll talk to you guys about later on in uh, advanced classes. But again, we're talking about two IRT schedules in which we're not just reinforcing responses, but we're reinforcing that a response must be separated by a period of time before the next response. And we will be talking about this when we get to the section on um, behavior reduction because a lot of times people think that the only way you could reduce behavior is through the use of punishment. And I'm going to point out to you that time and time again, the problem behavior people engage in is really not the behavior per se. They just do the behavior too darn much. We don't want to eliminate the behavior. We just need to reduce the rate or frequency at which the behavior occurs, and then it's not a problem. We don't have to use punishment most of the time. All we have to do is recognize the fact that if these behaviors are sustained at a high rate by ratio schedules or variable ratio schedules, all we have to do is arrange contingencies of reinforcement which generate and utilize these IRT schedules. And when you use an IRT schedule greater than T, and you make that the requirement between two successful responses must be separated by a period of time, this is a way to reduce the rate of behavior without having to resort to using punishment. Okay? Now, I have deliberately left off an example here of an example of an IRT greater than T in real life. The reason why I did this is I wanted to see which one of you students are going to present to me an example of an IRT greater than T uh, and how it's actually used in one of the schedules of reinforcement. Uh, I've already given you a couple of hints, but I'll give you one more hint to solve this problem. An IRT less than T is, is generally the kind of contingency that's operated on ratio schedules. Okay, I'll elaborate on that in a second. Another schedule of reinforcement is a schedule called R bar equal to T. Whenever you see the R with a bar above it, it means no response, okay? No response for time T. In other words, if I have an R bar equal to T, which is 60 minutes, it says that if this response does not occur for 60 minutes, a reinforcer will be delivered. So in other words, a specific response must not occur for some time value for a reinforcer to be delivered. On this schedule, by the way, this R stays the same from one reinforcer to the next. It's always the same amount of time. If we're looking at an R bar equal to 60 minutes, it means that if this response doesn't occur for 60 minutes, they get a reinforcer. When we deliver that reinforcer and we say, congratulations, thank you for not doing that behavior, we begin the next interval of 60 minutes from that point there and go onward. This type of schedule in literature may be uh, oftentimes called differential reinforcement of other behavior, zero behavior, the omission of behavior, or you'll most likely see it called DRO programs. It's also commonly referred to as omission training because you are teaching the omission of a response. That is, you are teaching the omission that a specific response doesn't occur for a period of time. Okay? We recognize the fact that when you're not engaging in this specified response, you certainly are not engaging in zero behaviors per se. In other words, if you say that uh, I will reinforce this person for not hitting somebody, for every 60 minutes they don't hit somebody, I'll give them a reinforcer. You know, Of course, they might not hit anybody for 60 minutes, but that doesn't mean they're not doing other behaviors. And here's where you got to be careful. If you find out that uh, they've been in their room for 60 minutes, uh, and there's been nobody who's had contact with them. They've never had an opportunity to hit anybody. So obviously, they meet the reinforcement criteria, you know. But the real question is, is that do they do this behavior when other people are present? This gets into some of the strategies around how we come to use 
various types of DROs. And you'll learn about momentary DRO versus whole interval DRO. And again, these are discussions that will happen probably in your second, third, and fourth courses. Okay, Which is the proper DRO to use in behavioral programming? I oftentimes find that, again, because of its fixed nature, that is, that it does not vary from one reinforcement to the next, these schedules, too, can generate these bizarre aberrant behaviors during post-reinforcement, what we call adjunctive behaviors. Now, a good example of this uh, uh, is, a, is a certificate of deposit. You put your money in a, in, um, uh, in a CD, which says that it's a CD for one year. And if you do not withdraw this money for one year, after one year, it will mature, and then you could actually gain access to the interest that's uh, due to you. Okay. Another one of these examples are people who receive these medals uh, for refraining from um, alcohol abuse. For example, if you are an, uh, uh, an alcohol anonymous or narcotics anonymous and so forth and so on, uh, you get these merits if you go 30 days without engaging in, in, uh, in um, uh, drug taking behavior you'll get this reward. If you go 60 days, one year, two years, and so forth and so on, these are good examples of um, reinforcers contingent upon the absence of behavior. And by the way, these little stars and these trinkets that you get are token reinforcers, okay? as are these. This is a token reinforcer delivery. A certificate of deposit is a token economy of sorts. And again, as I mentioned to you before, and we will come back and talk about this, that token reinforcement is the way of the world. It is pretty much unavoidable uh, that we use these things. However, how we use these things are, are ver should be very carefully considered. Uh, I've used token economies. Uh, they're certainly not my first choice. I'd much rather use other techniques, such as verbal praise and other contingencies. But at times, I will use a token economy, particularly if I know I have an individual who responds better under token economy because it's more the contingencies are more concrete. They're spelled out clearly. 